Okay, folks, let's get this one underway because the sooner we get done here, the sooner we get to lunch. Um, this is section 11B number two, quantifying the accuracy of wastewater spatial interpolation techniques on Tuesday, September 13th. Our speaker today is Nathan Fogue with Brown and Caldwell. Nathan is driving innovation by let me try this again. Nathan is driving innovation by seeking sustainable and resilient solutions for the water sector and the communities that we serve. Nathan has been modeling natural systems and urban inter interest infrastructure for more than 20 years and is keenly focused on new advances in data science and decision support to address climate change risks and vulnerabilities. Nathan, it's all yours. Thanks. Thank you. All right, so today we're gonna to talk about rainfall. And we're gonna talk about, here, I'm gonna give you a little bit of an, give a little bit of an overview on what I'm gonna go over today. Uh, first, we're gonna talk about the problem or the issue and why we're talking about rainfall, why it's important. Uh, then I'm going to talk about spatial interpolation techniques that we use to uh, figure out the distribution of rainfall over a particular area of interest. And then I'm going to focus a little bit more on one particular method, and that's gauge-adjusted radar rainfall. After that, I'm going to take a look at various techniques and look at the accuracy of each of them using a method we call um, leave one out method. And then I'll talk a little bit about data availability and where you can get things like radar rainfall to do similar types of analyses. There we go. Okay, so let's start off first to talk about the issue at hand and why we're concerned with rainfall. And that would be if we have a particular area of interest, it may not be located in the same place that we have rainfall data. And so we have a gauge network in an area like this, and this is actually in Northern Seattle. Um, and our area of interest is located some distance from our other rain gauges. We need to come up with some method. We need to determine what's the rainfall at our location of interest relative to you know, where our gauges are located. And why is having accurate rainfall important? Well, it's really crucial when we come to infrastructure planning, right? So let's think about an infrastructure planning process where first we measure our rainfall and gather our rainfall data um, and we identify particular you know, events of interest or time series uh, to do an analysis. Well, we use that data to calibrate a model. And these can be various types of models for various types of infrastructure systems. This could be drainage systems. It could be combined sewers where we're looking at potentials for overflow and wet weather management. Uh, this could be flood resilience. And so we have to have rainfall to be able to drive that model to be able to determine things like runoff and flows. And once we've, once we've calibrated a model and we're evaluated the performance of our system, like the capacity of our system, well, then we can look at where we have deficiencies in meeting our levels of service. And this is where we would design improvements to bring up our capacity or to bring up our performance to meet those levels of service. And we would construct our improvements or build new infrastructure based on our results and our design. And then we had to monitor our performance. So this is a pretty typical capital improvement planning process. And that could be driven by rainfall analyses. So what if our rainfall data are not accurate? Well, when we get to our modeling stage, the location or the extent or the, um, the issue that we're looking for, the problem may not be correct. We may not have proper understanding and characterization of the extent or magnitude of our issue or a problem. This could lead to wrong solutions or ineffective solutions or ones that are not properly sized, which of course can have impacts on the cost of your project and the capital investments may not be properly spent. And worse yet, your project may not actually perform to the risk criteria that you specified in the beginning. So rainfall data that are driving this type of analysis are crucial to being accurate. So let's talk about spatial interpolation and how we would typically go about doing this. So the data that we have, we have our location of our area of interest. So they say like a sewer shed or a watershed or a particular site. 
We have the location of all the rain gauges that would be nearby in our rain gauge network. And then we have the recorded data that we, uh, has been observed at each one of these rain gauges. So we would take all this information, we would plug it into a type of infiltration algorithm. And there are various types of algorithms and I'll talk about four different ones today. And when you crank through the, the numbers there, you end up with rainfall data that now is focused on your area of interest. So several, several inter spatial interpolation techniques that we use are really just plain old numerical methods or what I would call a, a pure spatial interpolation. Um, things like inverse distance weighting is one or Kriging is another. And I'll show you what those you know, typically are and what those look like in a minute. But there's another method that we can use where we use radar data that are now widely available. Um, so NEXRAD is the radar system by NOAA and the National Weather Service. And they use reflectivity data to estimate rainfall intensity or can be used to estimate rainfall intensity. So if you have radar data, you can actually now do what we would call a radar assisted spatial interpolation to, to come up with an improved data set. So what do these things look like? This is just a sort of simple example of if we have a, a spatial area of interest and there are several different locations where we actually have observed values, well, we wanna um, interpolate using a standard numerical technique. Here's one that we use very commonly, um, nearest neighbors, or we often call it decent polygons, where you just take the data from the gauge that's closest to your area of interest or to the, to the I'm sorry, the cell in which you're uh, interpolating your data. So there's simple nearest neighbor, there's inverse distance weighting, which really determines your value based on how far it is from the, from the gauges. There's Krigging, which is very similar to inverse distance weighting, but uses more of a geospatial correlation. And then there's the use of NEXRAD uh, radar data. And this is the one I wanna talk about in a little bit more detail. So first, let's talk a little bit about the, ne the NEXRAD system and the data availability. So NEXRAD is part of, what NEXRAD stands for Next Generation Radar. It's, um, it's a system by, the, the, by NOAA and the National Weather Service. And there are 160 gauges around the country. So there's pretty good coverage for most areas of the country. Um, it's also referred to sometimes as the Weather Surveillance Radar or um, WSR 88D network, 160 gauges. And rainfall intensity can be estimated by the reflectivity of radar from the particular or from the raindrops or the uh, water particles in the air. And so just based on the reflectivity data, you can come up with rainfall estimates alone um, in what we would call unadjusted rainfall estimates. But unadjusted estimates themselves uh, don't tend to be accurate. They're very good at spatial representation of where rainfall may be intense but the absolute value of the rainfall may not be super accurate. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So first, let me talk about how we convert reflectivity into rainfall values. So there's a, an equation called the Marshall-Palmer equation. And so Z is the re reflectivity. That's what the radar data is giving you. And then R is the rainfall intensity, say for like millimeters per hour. And so, a and B are empirically determined values uh, to make this conversion from reflectivity into, um, into rainfall intensity. So typical values for A and B are A like 200 and B like 1.6. So there are a lot of studies and there's some variation in the values of A, but these are very commonly used. So with this equation now we can come up with radar, our estimates of rainfall based on radar. But as I mentioned, radar by itself may not be a good estimate of the absolute value of the rainfall. And so here, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about what we get from estimates of rainfall from rain gauges and what we get from radar rainfall and compare the two. So the accuracy of rain, the rainfall estimate for rain gauges is actually excellent. Um, usually a, a very standard method is just using a, a tipping bucket rain gauge. And those are commonly known to be pretty accurate, usually within like 2% accuracy. So at local, you know, at single locations where we have a rain gauge, we actually have a pretty good estimate of rainfall. But the spatial coverage is poor because they're only point estimates, they're only in certain locations and we can only have a, a network that's so dense, right? So 
um, we can't really cover large areas as easily because we're just we just have a rainfall gauge network. So when we talk about radar rainfall, as I mentioned, the, the, the accuracy of an unadjusted set of radar rainfall is, is relatively poor. But the spatial coverage, of course, is excellent. And we have a good resolution of data and can cover a lot more area. So the idea here is to take advantage of both and do what we call gauge-adjusted radar rainfall. And so when we, what we do here is, and this is uh, city of Seattle, and the locations of rainfall gauges in Seattle. Um, and Seattle was kind enough to offer some radar, uh, I'm sorry, some rainfall data from their networks. And I'll use this in our, our analysis today. And so if we have uh, on the left, our unadjusted radar rainfall. So we have a distribution of, of rainfall based on reflectivity and then adjusted, I'm sorry, calculated with the uh, Marshall Palmer equation. And then within that we have actual estimates at each one of these dots or each one of these rain gauges. Well, what we can do is we can determine what's the difference between what our Marshall Palmer equation predicted and what we actually recorded at each one of these gauges. And we can come up with an error estimate or a difference estimate. And then we can actually come up with a distribution of that difference estimate across the entire area of the city of Seattle here, and then use that to adjust and come back to a new set of radar or of rainfall that is the radar data spatially adjusted for the errors that we calculated across the city. So now we have a new set that's the adjusted radar rainfall across the city. So let's talk a little bit more about the accuracy of those. How accurate are these various methods um, that we've talked about today compared to each other? Okay, so in order to look at the accuracy, we wanted to do what we call a leave one out cross validation to do a quantitative analysis of the, rain or the rainfall data that we have. So looking again at Seattle and the data that we have there, uh, we have 22 rain gauges distributed throughout the city and we obtained uh, the most recent years of data, about five or six years of data. And from that, we selected about eight storm events, um, actually even within the last three years. And we looked for some of you know, various events, different magnitudes, sort of durations, intensities, um, distributions, just to get kind of a nice selection of storms. And so we have uh, data, each one of these gauges for each one of those events. And now I'm gonna zoom in on one area to talk a little bit about how we conduct this leave one out analysis. So we kind of zoom in again, this is the same area we looked at earlier with um, in Northern Seattle, say we have four, four rain gauges where we have data and what we can do is we can take any one of these gauges. Oops. There we go. And we can, we can blind it. We can take it out. That's our leave one out. So if we take one of these gauges, rain gauge one, for example, and we assume it's not there, we blind it from our analysis. And now we go back in and we do an interpolation and we figure out what the spatially distributed uh, data would say for the rainfall here. For, for each one of our um, methods. Then we can actually come back and say, okay, let's check the error when we didn't see it, but we actually know what's there because we recorded the data there. What's the difference when we spatially interpolated based on the remaining gauges? And that error helps give us an idea of um, the accuracy of our estimate from spatial interpolation. So what we would do is going back again, now we'll jump and blind, um, rain gauge 34 out, and we do the same thing. We'll interpolate across the whole area, and then we'll check the error there. And then we would do it for rain gauge four, check the error, and then blind out rain gauge seven, and check the error. So now we've got error estimates at each one of these locations for each rainfall event we've done. And we can do that four different times using four different methods of sp uh, spatial interpolation. So the one on the left we, we mentioned is the nearest neighbors are using like decent polygons to estimate what the rainfall is. Um, we did it using inverse distance weighting. We did it using ordinary Kriging and then GAR or gauge adjusted radar rainfall on the far right. So now we've run this across all four methods and we've done it for all our gauges and we've done it for eight different storm events. So now we start to have quite a bit of information 
to look at the accuracy. So now let's look at the average error that we calculated across all of these gauges. So here's our eight different events and our four different methods. And now looking at the average error um, from each of them. So the one we see that performed the best is the gauge adjusted radar rainfall at about 20% average error across all these different events compared to the one that performed the least uh, well would be the nearest neighbor at about 27%. So this analysis um, is something we actually performed the first time uh, in, for the city of Milwaukee. And so I wanted to see just a comparison of how, what kind of results we got here versus, the, versus what we got at the city of Milwaukee. And so the relative comparison between the different methods came out about the same. In both cases, uh, the gauge adjusted radar rainfall outperformed the other, the other methods. Um, what was interesting about this is that the overall error that was calculated for the Seattle data was higher than what it was for the Milwaukee data. I don't know why. Um, this is something that I'm going to be very interested in, in looking into further. Um, it, it's not to say anything about the accuracy of the rain net, the rain gauges or the rainfall data collection at Seattle because we've assumed that the rain gauges are accurate. This is this. This method assumes that our tipping bucket gauges are accurate and that that's the correct data, was that our observed data is. So what this might relate to is just a greater spatial variation between the gauges. Because the other thing I, I noticed doing this is that the density of the rain gauges in Seattle is actually greater than it is in Milwaukee. The Milwaukee gauges actually cover greater distances. Um, but I do know that Seattle has a little more elevation change and there may be other things contributing to how much variation spatially you get in Seattle. So this I found would be a very interesting result. And so another, another thing we looked at here was how do the accuracy or the error estimates we get vary depending on how close gauges were to the location that we were uh, testing. And so as we would expect, the closer uh, the nearest gauge is to the location that we're looking at, the better the, the, the estimate and the lower the error. And then as we move away from that, um, the error gets greater. And what we see is that it eventually it gets to be, it gets to level out and sort of plateau as we move away. And again, we see the same thing we saw in the table before where the gauge adjusted radar rainfall um, outperforms as we move away, especially early on about all of them do very similarly, all the interpolation techniques, but as we move away, uh, the gauge adjusted radar rainfall tends to do a little bit better. So let's talk a little bit about where we can get this data. Um, the good news is that radar data is freely available. Um, it's been collected for a long time now, and there's a lot of data and information for many years and covering all of the United States. So. Um, there's a lot of information available. Um, just to name, oops, did I hit the right button? Yeah, oops. It's reflectivity. So um, what we call is the, the, the level two reflectivity data is the one that you use. There's di many different products and types of data that's available. Um, it's a level two reflectivity data um, that you would obtain to do this type of analysis. So here's some of the places where the data are available. So of course, NOAA from the National Centers for Environmental Information, you know, talks about where you can obtain the data and how you can obtain the data. But there are also big data repositories. Google and there um, has public data sets. This is open and free data that you can obtain it from there. Amazon Web Services also has um, data uh, repositories where you can obtain the data. And then. The, obtaining the data and processing the data can be done many different ways. And there are a lot of software packages out there to help you do this. Here's three, three examples. Um, the Calamar um, by Kisters um, can do this. Uh, InfoWorks ICM by Innovise is another software package that can help you process and work with radar rainfall data. And SWIM by CHI is another, is another option. And then there are also services out there that can help you develop these products. Uh, View and Associates and OneRain uh, 
are two examples of services that can help you get the data and do the processing and provide the data for you. And then there are other options too for working with the data. There are a lot of open source Python libraries out there uh, that you can do to develop your own processes to do this and you can customize processes. And this is the what Brown and Cobble did for developing uh, these analyses, both in Milwaukee and here, because this allowed us to set up um, efficiencies in being able to do this and repeat the process uh, multiple times for multiple locations. And what that looks like a little bit is um, downloading the NextRad data. And here again, this is the level two reflectivity data files that we obtain. Um, and this NextRad AWS um, is an open source library, Python library that we can use to do this. And then we extract that uh, re reflectivity data and put it into a grid. And PyART is an open source library that helps us do that. We, then we calculate the unadjusted total rainfall from the reflectivity, as I mentioned earlier, using an, a Marshall Palmer equation. And then we calculate the adjusted total rainfall uh, using the rainfall data at our gauges. And that adjustment can be done using uh, the WRAD library. Uh, and that's another open source Python library. And then we're able to generate hi hiatus graphs um, for our rainfall event of interest. So we use these different libraries. We do some of our own custom coding to really create a whole process that can now allow us to run through uh, many gauges, many uh, different events and put that together. So conclusions from our analysis. Um, we do see that gauge adjusted radar rainfall provides a better interpolation than the standard numerical techniques. Um, when we looked at the two locations where we've done this, both Seattle and Milwaukee, um, we see similar relative performance between the different techniques. Though, as I mentioned, we did see that um, Seattle had a little bit higher error, error uh, ranges than Milwaukee, and there's various reasons I'd like to look into that. So really, I think there are some further studies we'd like to look into, um, looking at additional cities, looking at the conditions that they have there, and maybe the climates they have there and their, those sort of characteristics to see how that might uh, influence the different errors that we see using the, the gauge adjusted radar rainfall. And I just wanted to make a couple acknowledgements. Um, uh, Seattle Public Utilities and Carapec uh, helped me obtain this radar rainfall. I'm sorry, not the radar rainfall, the gauge data for Seattle. So thank you to Seattle Public Utilities for allowing us to use your data. And Matt Davis, who's uh, also with Brown and Caldwell, who uh, developed the code, developed the, the Python approach to doing this and actually crunched all these numbers for us. So, and that's, that's all I have. So I think I have time for questions. <laughs> Yeah, in the back. I haven't haven't looked into that, that but I, I think that's a nice suggestion. I think there are a lot of different things we could look into as where the errors are and how it relates to characteristics. And as I mentioned, in fact, I think another thing that would be really nice for further analysis is a little more rigorous um, this, uh, selection criteria on the, the rainfall events. Um, what we did here was really sort of just, we took a look at it and kind of decided that we got a nice distribution of rainfall, um, a nice distribution of characteristics, but we could come up with ways of looking at magnitudes, frequencies, um, spatial variations, and come up with some different um, criteria for how we select those events do more events, and then maybe we have enough data to look at some of the things that you're suggesting. It can be interesting. Yeah. No, that's a great question. You know, I, there was a, a map or a figure that Noah has that I, I was thinking about putting in here um, that actually shows the, the coverage because there are some areas, especially in the mountainous um, west and in Oregon where you don't get um, good next ride data where it's kind of blind because of the topography. And I know Oregon has some of those. Um, and then of course the accuracy of ne next rad 
does come into play here too, right? And that there is a difference depending on how far you away, are away from um, the, the various stations. Uh, it doesn't always mean that it's, it's less accurate when you're further away, really because as you move away, there's an angle to you know, the Doppler radar. And so when you move away, it's actually just covering a different elevation of the, of the events or the, the precipitation or the storms. Um, sometimes that's helpful, sometimes it's not, right? It depends on the nature of the storm and where the moisture is. Um, but there is another element at play there about how, how close you are to a Doppler radar station and where the moisture is in the atmosphere and, and where you're at on the angle of the, um, the radar. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad you, you brought that up um, because uh, I, after I got here, I reread re my abstract that said, I'm gonna talk about level of effort and I don't have it in here. Uh, um, so we do have some, uh, some, some estimates on that. And in particular, it's about the relative difference between processing this information. Um, and then of course, it depends on scaling of how many gauges and how many events and things like that. But just in terms of processing, and this is assuming that you have all your tools set up. We've got our Python libraries and we, we're just basically pushing go at this point. Um, doing some of the simple methods of interpolation, that just happens you know, very quickly. It's, it's, a, it's a minute or two minutes you know, every time you generate uh, a, gra a, gra a grid, um, and that would be like the nearest neighbor or inverse distance weighting, right? Um, Krigging takes a lot longer because it does a lot of st statistical correlation. Um, and actually Krigging could take you hours. Um, and for some of these, we could be up to like five hours for processing a fairly large grid area, like a city scale. Um, the gauge adjusted radar rainfall is more on the scale of one to two hours However, a big portion of that is the downloading of the data. So you download very large data files and that takes time and then it's processing. So again, we're probably at one to two hours per interpolation method for a gauge adjusted rate of rainfall, but a majority of that would be downloading. If you have the files already stored locally, then, now, then it gets closer to the simple interpolation methods in terms of time. Yeah, for the processing, it would be. And it depends on the resolution of the grids that you process. I believe we did ours at a 25 meter grid resolution. Um, and that relates to the hours that I gave you there. So there are things you can do to try to speed up or, or um, adjust how long it would take. But um, I'm trying to think of the, the number. I mean, when we're talking about the city scale for Milwaukee and Seattle, you know, it covers quite a few square miles. Yeah. Those, yeah, those gauges are about a mile and a half um, to two miles uh, away from each other. Those ones that I showed you there, and that's and it's a pretty that's pretty typical as you look across Seattle. Uh, most of the gauges are within about a mile and a half to two and a half miles of each other. Um, it's a pretty dense network, really. You know. That's, that's an interesting question. Um, if, I, if I get where you're coming from, it's almost, almost as if, like, like if we wanted to be able to see you know, very accurately you know, the average annual rainfall for Seattle, which we don't usually, you know, our average annual rainfall, our regional methods of looking at rainfall don't always get really tight into, the, you know, into that level of um, detail. Could the radar rainfall maybe inform that in some way? And I don't know the answer to that. I do know that for the events that we look at, that every event is so different, right? Just so dramatically different. 
partially we selected that in purpose, but um, you definitely see some you know, convective storms that are just located in the north of Seattle, where they often get some of these near the convergence zone. And you see some that are general storms that the pattern, you know, it varies, but not greatly across the, the city. So different types of storms, I get a lot of different variation when we look at the ra radar rainfall, just depends on the storm. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we try to get a little bit of each of those right, and everything in between. So I'd say out of the eight events, um, I'd say three or four of them tended to be a little more of the general storms that um, were pretty widespread, not a ton of spatial variability, um, and had most of the rainfall distributed over a 24-hour you know, period or maybe even two to three days. We got some events of that. Then we had some also that were much more localized, uh, and a lot of the rainfall was di distributed or over you know, very intense uh, 15 minutes to one hour, or I, we got a little bit of everything. I think we got one that was more like a three hour event. Yeah, we tried to pick a little bit of everything for this. Again, we only picked eight um, for processing time and that's something you could look at. I, I like the suggestion of really putting more rigor behind the storm selection because that might, you know, help you see patterns um, in error. Yeah. Yeah, does this go, yeah, go backwards? I can, and I can provide people the slides. If you, these are the Python, these are the Python libraries that we've, we've used. And if you, any one of these, you just Google it, what the, the terms in yellow, you go right to it. Uh, you just, it's, it's a Git repo. So like on a GitHub, there'll be documentation there. Okay, any other questions? Thank you.